Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, I hope things are doing, you're doing well. Today, uh, we're going to have quite a program today, I think. Uh, we have Professor Winters. I'm going to call him Professor Winters today. We're going to James. James has been in the community for quite some time, but he's, he's, uh, he's, he's basically has been educated within the community, within this area for that matter. He's a businessman. He was a former businessman and a very successful one, and, and he's still active, if you will, uh, within the, the Portland community, I would say, at this point in time. He's at Portland State, and he's... Uh, He's a prof down there, and uh, and he's been on the show on several different occasions, and I thought this would be an opportune time to, to bring him on today, and and we're just going to just probably just touch bases on some of the issues that um, you're pretty well uh, aware of. For instance, the Boston situation, that's the big the Boston Marathon thing. That's a that's a huge piece right now at this point in time. Uh, we're going to talk about jobs uh, here within the within the state of Oregon. Maybe if we, we get, him, get him to talk a little bit about the whole issue of intel and and uh, and Nike in regards to uh, providing jobs for for some so-called subsidies or benefits um, uh, going to their particular resp- corporations uh, for, if you will, uh, to, for, for providing jobs for Oregonians or whatever. But we're gonna go through that piece, and we may touch bases on on uh, maybe one of the movies here of late that might be of some of interest to a number of you who are watching us here today. So with that, why don't we just jump right on in here and. Uh, and, uh, and and welcome uh, the pro- the professor here today, James. How you doing? All right, man. It's good, all good, 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 <laughs> good. Well, since the last time, uh, some a number of things have happened of late, and um, let's let's just get right into that Boston Marathon thing right off the bat. When you first first off, when, when did when, when were you first um, aware of it, and and how what was your reaction to that? Well, I, I got a message. Um, one of these news flashes on my, uh, I think it was on my phone or my pad, tablet, computer, um, and the the information was very scant mm-hmm. at, at the beginning. But uh, uh, I I did manage to turn on the TV and observe uh, the film. I think it was clearly a uh, some kind of explosive device, mm-hmm. and um, I mean a, a lot of. Uh, uh, I think a lot of things get conjured up when you see something like that uh, at that time and place. And considering it was Patriot Day, um, and uh, it was next to an event that uh, has uh, uh, a lot of history and reverence to this country, um, I thought I uh, <clears throat> uh, it was uh, no surprise to me that they. Uh, they were able to resolve the situation mm-hmm. uh, very quickly, uh, and uh, I, I think that all uh, people who participate in evil will probably take note that the, we're a society that is uh, under quite a bit of surveillance, mm-hmm. uh, especially on the exteriors of uh, the public's right of way. Uh, so it didn't surprise me that they uh, they were able to uh, uh, come full circle. Uh, on it very quickly. Uh, I did have an opportunity uh, uh, in the car to listen to uh, Rush Limbaugh talk about the situation and he mm-hmm. was uh, um, kind of uh, in a way shape or form directing uh, the lack of information about the description right. of the perpetrators uh, mm-hmm. towards President Obama. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said that one reporter said that they were brown skinned. Mm-hmm. Right. He said why don't they just come out and say that they were brown skinned. And uh, this was before the video was released. I think uh, if anyone had an opportunity to look at the video, uh, first of all, it was very difficult to tell what race they were. Uh, Second of all, um, now that they've uh, uh, appeared to have resolved this situation, I don't think it would have been appropriate to say that they were Mm brown-skinned because they're clearly not. They're Europeans. in some news reports, uh, Islamic radicals, but they're clearly, to me, uh, Europeans in appearance. Um, so it seemed to that seemed to be at odds with with his old theory about why they didn't say. I thought they didn't say because they didn't know. Um, one of the things that I, I think be- CNN also made made, made that point. Too. A- absolutely, yeah. and, and I hope and I um, that was interesting that uh, 
uh, as we talk about tolerance, I think it gets uh, talked about a little bit too much and nothing is really done about it. But we talk about tolerance, I think we should um, take away from this thing that all um, uh, people who are in the uh, Islamic religion are not terrorists, mm -hmm. but also we should take away that all people who are in the Islamic religion are not brown skin. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of European nations uh, where uh, Islam is practiced. And um, uh, one news story has said that uh, some, uh, some young man, either a college or high school student, bore some kind of resemblance uh, to the perpetrators and he, was, he felt his safety was at risk. He was getting threats. Uh, people were calling the police and saying that that's him. And uh, uh, looking at his photo, he didn't really bear much resemblance uh, to the alleged perpetrators, except for the fact that he had a, a Middle Eastern name. Mm -hmm. But that initial report, that initial media blurb, if you will, you're right. Uh, he, the people were black. In fact, I noticed that on MSNBC or something mm -hmm. like that. MSNBC. I mean, right. And I think Al Sharpton spent it. And I, and I really, I got to give him credit for, for Al for that particular time because because he was on na in, in the national news, as you know. He reported it. He talked about this same issue, which I thought was good at the time. And also he has a radio station. And he also basically alerted the, um, uh, the African-American community because they were worried too. And, uh, and in all due respect, I think all cultures, after a while, then it got down to cultures <laughs> because mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't want to claim him as, even as a white. You know, it was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, now he's Russian. You yeah, know now, so well, he's, he's not European. my tribe. Yeah. yeah, not my tribe. He's a European. Yes, and, right, right, and, right. But, I mean, the, the bigger message there is that before we um, uh, tie a race of people yeah, in yeah, yeah, with yeah. Uh, uh, acts of terror, because there have been some uh, white Americans yeah. involved in terror, mm -hmm. Timothy McVeigh. Uh, uh, we had a, a person arrested in Texas for him and his wife for gunning down a couple yeah. of uh, uh, judges. Mm -hmm. uh, before we make those kinds of judgments, we really need to sit back and take a yeah. look at where the world really is. Well, the media did catch up then from that point of view. Then all of a sudden just laying it out all on the table. Right. Well, some of them, on a, and, so and let's say, give, give, I would give a... To the limited amount of credit, I can give Fox uh, yeah, News some yeah, credit yeah, they because did, they yeah. seem to yeah. to stay away a yeah. little bit further from the brown skin right, kind of description. Yeah. They were very, very guarded, and I'm sure that they understood that a lot of this information coming out early. Uh, they had the suspects. Uh, right. They had them trapped. There was a uh, there was one report that said that there was a gunfire uh, at somebody's house. And there was blood on the porch, sort of thing. Uh, uh, there was a robbery at 7-Eleven convenience store that led to the whole thing. So there was a lot of misinformation, yeah. and that's to be expected. Uh, if you look at history and uh, all of the, uh, the uh, uh, trials and tribulations of this country, the Kennedy assassination, what kind of information came out mm -hmm. uh, when that took place, what happened with 9-11, uh, how many planes were involved, mm -hmm. uh, where the next plane was headed sort of thing. Uh, and when you have chaos, I mean, it definitely will keep uh, the, uh, the news bureaus guessing. But I think in, in large part, uh, other than the uh, description of race and, and, and definitely uh, erroneous on some of the events that took place, I thought they did a good job covering good. it. And I guess the other, the other concern that, it, that, that it also was on the table was the fact that many Americans are overly armed at this point in time and so there was this concern about the fact that Matt is if, if in fact it made this sort of a race thing if you will it had been pretty tense you know it was a pretty tense situation because people were I mean even to date is my understanding that um, you can't even find certain uh, as, as far as ammo and things of that nature and and and, uh, and and armory or whatever. So it's a, it's a tough situation at this point in time. Oh, uh, everybody's absolutely. tense. Everybody's pretty real. Stressed a absolutely. Out. And we don't. Uh, I I think that the gun control debate is something that's far overdue. I mean, yeah. you yeah. have the right to bear arms. What does that mean? Does that mean yeah. a tank, yeah. a bazooka, yeah. a machine gun? I mean, where does it begin and where does it end? And um, when that was put into the Constitution, we were always under the threat of an invasion uh, from uh, the UK or some other country. The, the, around the time that the United States was forming, there was a lot of uh, attempts to, uh, uh, to seize this part of the world. Um, henceforth, every, by arming every citizen, 
and giving them the right to form their own militia, that's a lot less expensive than having an army of three or four million uh, people. At the time, we couldn't afford it. But that's not the threat that we face today. The threat that we face is something being launched in this direction uh, from another country or, or even more so uh, somebody who's more a, of a ground level guerrilla type of terrorist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, in this debate we need to catch up with the times. And I, I think uh, that Americans should have the right to own guns, mm -hmm. but I think there have to be some kind of limits on them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't feel any better about, uh, you know, somebody that has uh, 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 the right to protect their property with one gun. I feel a lot less better if somebody has 25 or 30, you know, weapons in a gun rack. Like, what What are you up against? <laughs> Who's you know, your the, enemy? The issue of registration came up. How do you feel about that? I mean, there, there, there was... A, there was a vote not too long ago. When well, I Congress. think they should. I think guns should be registered. As, mm -hmm. as, I mean, the people that have grown up uh, outside of violence, they feel a lot differently mm -hmm. about about gun violence. You know, growing up in this part of the of Portland, I mean, I think all guns should be registered. I think there should be background checks. I think guns have to be accounted for. I think the owner should have some kind of insurance right. in case their gun makes it in the population mm -hmm. is used for ill-gotten gains. So I'm a strong believer, and it's the people that haven't really experienced that. They think, you know, that they've been watching CSI and they're going to appear on the scene in some bank robbery and become a hero, and it, it's never worked like that. Law enforcement has a lot of training, a lot of um, uh, uh, situational type of training, actually, where they they figure out, in most cases, who's who's on their side and who's not mm -hmm. and they have to make snap uh, judgment calls but they're trained to do that a citizen is not trained to do that mm -hmm. yeah i think you should be able to protect your own home but outside of that uh, i think you ought to be limited on what you can do with a gun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know on that same note uh, that, that something that's already acceptable along that line is like auto insurance you know, if all of a sudden we weren't, we weren't required, if you will, to register our vehicle and and and, um, and have some sort of insurance on the deal, you know, there's liability and this, that, and the other. But, but I think as time goes, I think it'll resolve itself as time goes. But it was good to talk about this issue. What do you think about the bombing? You think the bombing situation had an impact as far as the pendulum swinging more the uh, for the? Uh, I think it was runoff. probably small. Uh, uh, compared to uh, the re-election of President Obama, mm -hmm. I think that's. That swung the um, the gun and ammunition sales mm -hmm. higher than every everything else. It's not. I don't believe that there's a, a, a large segment of our our society that wants to form militias mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on that. I do believe that uh, a lot of uh, uh, the citizens feel like the the gun rights are going to be uh, diminished in the future, and they want to have the guns uh, in their place of uh, their place of residence right now so in the future if this does happen they already have what they need mm -hmm. what about the marijuana situation have you, have you looked at that piece of that from the standpoint that the state of washington now is is open for marijuana i think the state of uh, colorado, colorado is mm -hmm. you know and what do you think about that you think that's a good thing well personally i don't partake <laughs> but okay. but i also think that um uh I would be one of the ones that think that uh, it has some additional value, mm -hmm. and I don't see the big difference between that and other types of, uh, of, of antiseptics that we apply to ourselves every day. The bottom line is, and I actually talk about this quite a bit at, at, at Portland State at the Park Blocks, is that we're, our demographics are moving in a direction where that is going to become more acceptable mm -hmm. and the people that have the the most reservations and resistance about it are you know headed out the back door mm -hmm. it's their their time is just about up uh the 1960s baby boomers are now heading towards retirement age and they've raised their kids uh <clears throat> a lot of them excuse me have raised their kids to think that it's not all that bad to smoke marijuana so it's becoming more widely accepted uh, I don't think that that's the, a big cause of trouble in society as, as much as poverty is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in the future you'll see less resistance. Those These two states that pass, it won't be the last two. 
I think uh, over time you'll see quite a bit of activity uh, where marijuana is legal. Now, what does that mean for society? Um, I think that uh, it has to be um, measured just like any other intoxicant, just like alcohol. I mean, whatever they're smoking, it does have an effect on your behavior. It does have an effect on your ability to to do functions, drive a car, uh, uh, do your job at work. Uh, so we, we need to keep that in mind. It's not something that's just going to let you relax and, and proceed with the day as if you didn't didn't partake in anything. What do you think about the Portland Metropolitan area? You at Portland State? Uh, and you, how, did, how did those? How did the young folks uh, react to the to the fact that Washington has, has accepted their piece? And and uh, is this something that uh, they, they they are discussing? Uh, no, really, I haven't really heard heard ever much about it. But because you know the people that are doing it are doing it anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so now they're able to do it outside or in in public places. That's the mm -hmm. only difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think people that uh, uh, that smoke marijuana are not really concerned about the repercussions. Mm -hmm. Are they going to do it anyway? So I haven't really seen, um, you know, enough more more effects of it. I, I would say in, in places like Washington, uh, they're trying to figure out because of the loose wording of the initiative uh, on where this can actually be taking place at mm -hmm. uh, versus where it would be illegal at. And right now it's a, a, a huge gray area. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we haven't uh, heard the last of voter initiatives uh, as far as marijuana in the state of Washington, although it's legal. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we haven't heard the last of voter initiatives trying to figure out where it can and can't take mm -hmm. place. Well, let's talk about education for a moment. You think that you know the system has just changed, so to speak, the... It has been said that the governor is the new czar, if you will, or the, the, the superintendent, if you will, of public education throughout the state. And he, and that he recently hired someone, it was it Cruz, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what do you think about that at this point in time? First mm -hmm. off, what do you think about um, uh, the position that the governor has taken? And secondly, uh, what, what do you think about the update in terms of the direction that they're going? Um, I I, I'm not 100% sure that putting the governor in charge is going to solve or change anything, but I also feel like uh, these are desperate times and they call for desperate measures. Uh, and on on the service, I think that it, it looks like a pretty good uh, uh, a pretty good way of approaching things if you're the governor and you want to be responsible for education. And I really can't blame them. Uh, because he's probably been sitting back with all his the terms that he served the governor being frustrated with mm -hmm. the lack of uh, academic progress in the state and he wants to take the bull by by the horns um, however if the funding levels are going to remain the same uh, as they are today uh, the way we uh, uh, bring in tax revenues in the state of Oregon the way we give tax breaks and abatements, I think he's going to find that he won't be very much successful than the last guy. It's a money problem. I don't know that it's a, uh, a teacher problem or a teacher compensation problem per se. There's just less money uh, for education as a percentage of our, our budget than there has been in the past. <laughs> now, again, let's, now let's talk more specific about uh, the Portland metropolitan area. Portland public schools, but what do, you, what do you think about their definition? I mean, well, they're uh, suffering. They're suffering. They're yeah. suffering, and and the ones that are suffering the most are the ones that uh, primarily uh, have a lot of African American students. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are suffering the most. And uh, I know that in Salem, it's being kicked around. I haven't really talked to anybody down there uh, in probably about three weeks, but I know that the idea of a sales tax is being kicked around down mm -hmm. there or some type of consumption tax. Uh, our tax system uh, as it stands now will, will not be able to uh, perform the functions of state government so something has to change either mm -hmm. astronomical state taxes mm -hmm. uh, levied on income and payroll which are regressive to the economy and, and job creation or some type of consumption-based tax. Mm -hmm. I don't see a way around 
uh, if they're going to actually do something that puts money in the, the treasury. I don't see around a way around the idea of, of uh, a consumption tax like a sales tax. You know, it's, it's still being said that there's a higher failure rate in the Portland Mel China area in terms of education, Portland public schools. And one someone says that uh, one of the reasons for that is the, the lack of voc ed within the school system. At one point in time, voc ed was, was very major in, in the, in the this public school situation. Well, outside of Portland, it is still. But in, inside Port, in Portland, in, as far as Portland public schools, it, it lacks the, the voc ed piece. And a lot of times, that's, a, that's an opportunity, if you will, for, for those folks who don't have access, if you will, to parents who are, who are lawyers and doctors and this, that, and the other, who are well able to go to private school and this, that, and the other. It gives them an opportunity, if you will, like a uh, metal shop and you know, all you know all these other book ed pieces and whatever. What do you think about that? Do you think this is something that we should we should look at? Put on well, the table we we we've uh, we've had this discussion before, and I, I think my position is uh, <laughs> etched in stone. <laughs> I, I I have said uh, previously, and I would say today that I I think that we have to. Uh, educate our students for tomorrow mm -hmm. and tomorrow uh, there won't be as many voc ed, ed jobs uh, as we've seen in the past and there are voc ed schools that do uh, primarily uh, private schools for profit institutions that that teach that and they from what I can tell they do a fair uh, fairly good job at it and we would be duplicating those kinds of services uh, by uh, reintroducing them into the high schools. What our high schools need is the basics. We need people that can read. We need people who know how to do basic math. And basic math 15, 20, 30 years ago was probably simple addition. Now it's a algebra. Now it's an intermediate algebra. Now it's differential equations. It's a lot of other things that uh, uh, really extended to the future of being uh, competitive in this country and so if we want to be a part of it we have to be better educated in the basics mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing that i see uh, as a professor is this it's not that uh, they would be better off as vocational students would be they'd be better off if they learned how to read and write uh, and do their arithmetic mm -hmm. the basic building blocks uh, that they had in the past if they learn how to do that better i think a lot of things would come together. You know, in fact, let me be a little bit better. Maybe I should, I didn't explain myself. Uh, when, I th when I think about voc ed, I, I think about the, um, the motivation or the enthusiasm to want to learn e English, if you will, to want to learn how to read. Because the definition, of you can read, but then you, you, in some cases people don't comprehend. So comprehension is a very key part in reading aspect of it. And a lot of times you need that little motivation stuff if you don't have any kind of a background, like auto mechanics, mm -hmm. in order to uh, uh, to rebuild an engine. For instance, you got to know what a micrometer is. You got to know how to measure stuff. You know, and you know, you, you basically you have to go to a late and cut. The, so my point is that then all of a sudden people are asking questions. Well, what is a micrometer? I mean, how did you get this 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 deal? And what do you do this? What about chemistry, if you will? You got oil, you got mm -hmm. gasoline, and what's the makeup of that? So all of a sudden, the person started getting more motivated to want to know more. Then all of a sudden, boom! I didn't know this was chemistry because I was making an F in chemistry. Mm -hmm. Now I understand. I know what the charts are, the element charts are now, what that means, and and that's why to me, vocab was so important. Uh, during the time I was coming and going to, going to school, so that's how I was relating to that. When I think about engineering, when I think when I think about all of the various trades, if you will, that we have, uh, basically cutting angles, you know, for algebra. Yeah, and angles. all that. So that's where I'm kind of. I'm just. And saying. all those things are done. Uh, uh, have fallen prey to automation. Um, I yeah, think no, your point is well taken, yeah. though, because I think it goes back to the 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 person in the front of the class, the teachers, the teachers. Uh, yeah. Uh, job to make sure the students are inspired and if we're going to inspire a browner United States of America we need to have browner teachers people mm -hmm. that understand I, and I've had um, uh, teaching the Portland State I have had some African students and some African American students and I always pull them aside and tell them what I expect from you is beyond what the class it okay. is uh, what's expected of the rest of the class. It's not that you're going to get more homework. You're not going to get graded any differently. I want to see more effort beyond what's required in the class, and I'm going to be on you. 
to do that because I care and I know that when you go out in society it's not going to be the same mm -hmm. for everybody else in the class it is going to be for you mm -hmm. you need to get some 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 wind beneath your wings you need to get some toughness uh, some leather skin mm -hmm. and learn to that things aren't going to roll for you the way they should at the beginning but over time uh, if you're tough enough and you've learned what you are supposed to learn you can win mm -hmm. do you think do you think that thinking about in the community college I, I, my position is that that uh, the vocators have sort of shifted to the community college you know taken out of the, the k1 to k12 you think we're ready now for k1 to k uh, let's say k14 so meaning that no. uh, that becomes part of the the the, uh, the formative years if you will meaning that when a person graduates from that formative year they get an associate degree no why no it's because we have too much ground to cover I mean, if anything, I think <laughs> based on what I've seen, I mean, nine years of grade school wouldn't be bad uh, in terms of time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you go from kindergarten to eighth grade, but I think kids should go to school in the summertime. In other countries, they go to school year-round. They don't take three months off. Mm -hmm. And three months over that many years is a lot. It's a lot of time where you could be learning. Um, uh, but to your point, I, I think that vocational education at the community college level is there. Uh, right. Most of the community colleges, Portland Community right. College, they have very, very good vocational uh, education programs. As far as inspiring kids, I think we ought to aspire or inspiring kids. Uh, we should be telling them to aim higher than that. Mm -hmm. But I guess the point I was making is that by giving during those formative years, you know, that's part of the guarantee, if you will, uh, uh, from K-1 to K-12, that every child should be given a, the best of education for that Absolutely. period. I'm just saying, why can't we go on and include that other two year and give them that associate degree? And, yeah. Because I, I don't... Parents a lot of times can't afford to go to right. higher ed. You know, right, and um, they don't have jobs. Yeah, you no. talking about from a funding standpoint? Well, besides just the funding aspect of it, but some some application to get a job. Right now, I mean, you graduate from high school, you don't have nothing. Nothing, and, and but, shoot, but and some in one a college job. degree in some instances don't do no, nothing. You're right, but at least in the in the, the that two year associate degree aspect of it, like I said, vocator sort of shifted to the to the community college aspect of it. Because uh, opportunities may be there, because employers a lot of times are looking at um, basically they're the other one that developed the so the basically the community colleges anyway. Well, we're we're in a, a society, Bruce, where technology is is changing virtually every minute. That's fair. There's companies. I have a bell a bag over there that says Dell Computer. Dell uh, is the leading uh, manufacturer of desktop computers, and now they're struggling. Because people in the space of three or four years have shifted to first laptops, now to tablets. They're not a big manufacturer, or distributor, or developer of tablet computers. And now they're going to get in the game when it's very, very, very late. It may be too late. Uh, so when we talk about vocational ed, we have to be talking about the building blocks that will supersede any changes that happen in the future. And, and that's the job of the superintendent yeah. sitting at that table trying to figure oh, out it, it, uh, where it, it goes. Well, his, his job is to allocate the resources so everybody has the same opportunity to mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would be the first to tell you in the past, I, I don't think that they've done a very good job of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully uh, the, the, new gover uh, the governor, by taking this new position, he has some more successes. But the, at the end of the day, if there's not going to be any more allocation uh, of money or a cure for the the shortfalls uh, that the state has. In addition, uh, the tax uh, the tax and regulatory climate of Oregon uh, to me is not really conducive mm -hmm. to a lot of businesses relocating here. You'll see some early stage companies, some tech companies come here, but you're not going to get the 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 meat and potatoes guys that have like 800 a thousand jobs for people who have a high school di diploma or just a little bit of two years of college. Okay. Well, folks, we're looking at, we, we're sitting here talking to uh, Professor Winters, and, um, and you notice we're going through, going through the maze of things that are happening to us on a day-to-day -day basis, and we're going to continue that. We're going to take a short break, and when we get back, we might even, he might have some comments on the CRC or the Columbia River kind of crossing, okay? We'll take a short break. We'll be right back.
You are watching Oregon Voters. Really affected our ability to be competitive, uh, uh, for our businesses to be competitive by being in downtown. Now this light rail is important because I believe that that is what is holding up Washington's approval of that new bridge. If you took the light rail part of it off, it would be uh, exponentially less expensive than what they have on the drawing board today. Then the and bridge wouldn't be built. Well, the bridge wouldn't be built on the part of without Oregon. The light, without the light rail. <laughs> on on the part even, of Oregon. The, the, the voters in Washington and in Clark County yeah. have said they do not want to use uh, their tax revenues to fund a light rail connection. Mm -hmm. They do want the bridge, mm -hmm. but they do not want the extra cost of, of the light rail. And not only that, I think that bridge would have a very, very small effect in the bigger scheme of things. Mm -hmm. We actually need a third bridge, and it would be yeah. cheaper. I've seen studies that said a third bridge yeah. uh, further to the west would be cheaper and more efficient to traffic flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's get a couple more. I've got about 15 more minutes, but I've got a couple areas I would like to chat with you about. J.C. Penney's, what does that say to you? Oh, yeah. They had a, they had, and we actually had a, a, an opportunity to... Uh, talk about that in uh, uh, the BA 495 weekend uh, cohorts class. Beautiful kids, beautiful uh, students, really open-minded, bright. We talked about the situation with J.C. Penney's where the CEO was fired um, uh, recently in the last month or so after a year of employment where the sales went down by by half. And one of the things that I was I'm getting the class to look at is the mistakes, the obvious mistakes that were made. If you go to Nordstrom's, you walk out of Nordstrom's with a nice bag, it's paper, it's square, block shaped, uh, maybe some tissue paper in there. It's so fashionable, people like to walk up and down the mall with it. You walk out of J.C. Penney's, which is trying to attack the same customer, you walk out with a plastic bag that you get out of Walmart. Hmm. They they switch their their clothing to more European. Uh, uh, clothes for smaller people. The country is getting larger, not smaller. So they told their core customers, "Hey, take a hike. You know, we want we want these this European look in here. If you can't fit it, find someplace else to shop." And the customer said, well, "Okay, we'll find someplace else to shop." Sales are down by half. So they let the guy go. But the the bigger question to me is not that the strategy failed. Is how that person got his job in the first place. Hmm. You know, this, this cronyism uh, is, is to me is the biggest business challenge that there is. He went to Harvard. Uh, the Bill Ackman, the ma majority shareholder, he went to Harvard too. So it's like, okay, let's put this guy in. This guy probably never even been in a J.C. Penney's his whole life. Doesn't understand who their customers are, what their customers want, who their competitors are. Hmm. Why are they selling things at this price and not at this price? He just like Looked down on it like Superman looking down uh, from, pro selected? from his planet. Why was he selected? Uh, because he uh, because he was supposedly the genius behind the Apple re retail store. He came from Apple's retail business, but come on, I mean, and then people don't go to Apple because of the the store is nice. The only thing that's there is the computer and a and a sign out front. Any if you want the iPad, you're gonna go and buy it off the street if you have to. People weren't going there because of the store. They were going in there because of the product. And when he bought that thinking in the J.C. Penney's, it fell flat. Well, maybe he was thinking about the fact that the, the country was going to be losing some weight. The country is going to be losing some weight. But so he's thinking, well, we're not pick it up right now. And, and when that happens. You know what? And when that happens, <laughs> uh, 20 or 30 years from now, I'm sure uh, J.C. Penney's, if they're still in business, will be uh, properly situated. But given the fact that uh, they're running out of money, he didn't have the time to do that. <laughs> okay, that's a good piece. Eh? I'm sure the students are going to have fun in trying to analyze that piece. What about the Jane let's, let's, let's go down to the movie industry. That's all kinds of social movie stuff, I mean, running all over the place. That was this movie, The Django. Oh, I had an opportunity to, to, to see it. Um, um, I don't go to movies much. Um, I think it affects my creativity, so I, I, I don't go to uh, grand openings and that sort of thing. But um, uh, I did go see the movie, and I, I wouldn't want to give it away for anybody else that hasn't seen it, but... I thought the cinematography was very good. Uh, the acting was fabulous. It it was the the departure from from fact that I had a problem with. Uh, uh, the character is a uh, uh, riding around in the south with a bounty hunter, and he's 
engaged in violence uh, in, in search of his, uh, his wife, who's a slave. And I think if any charitable look at history would tell you that that didn't happen, number one, that it, this was um, after the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that slavery was legal. It was ruled that, it, that, that you could capture uh, a free African American, even if he was free in the North, and enslave him. This was voted on and approved by the Supreme Court. So nobody in that movie had to sit back and watch Jamie Foxx make hay like he did. They could have shot him like he was a dog because that's what we were viewed as uh, at that time anyway was animals. So that was a big departure. There was other things in there like uh, the White Hoods. Uh, I guess that's supposed to be the Ku Klux Klan, which didn't really come into effect for uh, right. 40 or 50 more years. It was like... They, the only reason why they didn't have the hoods on back then is because it was legal. There was no need to hide. <laughs> I'm going reclaiming my property. And I think the danger in, in, in that kind of cinematography or that kind of story is that it, it diminishes what really happened. And I, I could see that he tried to balance that by showing the brutality, uh, some of the more brutal aspects of, of slavery. But I, I don't think that it, that it, it really covered it. To that extent, I mean, if you went to a movie and you you saw uh, George Washington driving around in a S class with a cell phone, you was like, wait a minute, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. That's not. He didn't, they didn't have cell phones back then. They didn't have a Mercedes back then. So why would I be <laughs> as enthused about going to a movie knowing that what really happened was somebody like Nat Turner, who really wreaked some havoc? It doesn't make for good cinematography, but that's the truth. Why would I go to a movie that has complete fiction and a dream and, and I guess what I'm supposed to do is walk out of the theater with some sense of satisfaction. That's what would have happened if had we got the opportunity, but it didn't. And you know, the, the weight of what took place at that time is still with us today. It didn't get washed away with Jamie Foxx you know, mm -hmm. wreaking havoc uh, in Texas and Mississippi. <laughs> maybe they, maybe they're sitting there, sitting there saying, "Well, okay, fine. We got to have another one, so you can see it." See, well, you yeah, I can. I would food. tell you, there, there's, there, there's not. I would be surprised if there was a Django too. You think so, really? Yeah, just without getting into how it ended, I don't think there'll be a Django too. Um, but you never can tell. I just felt like uh, uh, historically, if we're going to teach people uh, about the rich history of this country. Uh, good, bad, or ugly. We need to be on point. Okay, that's good. That's a good point. Hey, last last minute or so that we have here with, with you. Uh, what about the mayor? We got, we got Charlie Hill now, who's now mayor of the city of Portland. And and uh, what do you think? Uh, well, I think he's uh, been he's uh, if he was in a poker game, he's got a two and a seven two, kind of like President Obama had. And he needs a couple inside straights or some good bluffing. Uh, because he's been handed a losing hand. Uh, he's been handed a deficit, um, and to get rid of that deficit is going to be it's going to require some thinking way outside the box from what the city has has done uh, previously. And some people who have uh, come to know or come to count on the city for certain programs, certain streams of revenue, uh, are, it's going to have to they're going to have to get a good hard look at that and seeing where the real benefit is because the money right now, and I'm sure Mayor uh, Hales would be the first one to tell you that the money for that is not there anymore. Well, now, let, let's talk about uh, uh, the folks that are there at City Council and as far as the makeup of the City Council. Has been, you, do you foresee any African Americans being elected? It's possible. It's possible. There's some, uh, there's some, um, there's some worthy candidates out there. I think uh, uh, County Commissioner Loretta Smith uh, would probably be a, a, a good candidate if she's not aspiring for something higher. Uh, there's some, some, some young, up-and-coming, talented, educated African-Americans who, if they're given an opportunity, I think they could, uh, could be successful. The, the bigger challenge now is the the type of financing that you need to to run a race like that and you need millions and millions of dollars uh, and that's where I believe we're going to be challenged because we don't have uh, the business uh, backing of African-American businesses here like they do in Prince George uh, County Maryland 
we don't have the uh, backing of uh, of large uh, churches like maybe they do in in Birmingham, Alabama, or St. Louis, Missouri. We just don't have the income stream. So that's where the real challenge is going to be, not voter acceptance. It's, it's basically the nuts and bolts of running a campaign. Are they going to have the money to do that in the future? And that's that I couldn't tell you. You know, you seem to be very aware of what's going on in your surroundings and whatever. You know, I've got to ask this question. Mm -hmm. uh, what, why aren't you interested in running? Um, I heard President Obama, I think it was... Um, uh, NBC, Brian Williams asked him how he felt about the presidency and would he do it all over again he said I'm doing what I feel I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing is not politics <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some people that are very very uh, passionate about that I have no passion whatsoever for politics and I would knock on wood but I, that is not where I see myself in the future I'm I, I run but what, businesses. But what about a chief of staff to someone like the governor or the mayor? I think I would be a, you know? I'd be a poor candidate for that as well. <laughs> 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 he could do better. <laughs> well, James, this is this has been great. Is there anything else on your mind that you'd like to just share with me? We got about a minute. Uh, well, quick, I mean, right? just to to the politics. I, I think that uh, uh, for for myself personally, uh, there's so many talented. Uh, qualified uh, people of color out there. I think that that's really, uh, uh, we have nothing to worry about as far as that point is okay. concerned, but it's just the money. Okay, it's the money. Yeah, it's the money, okay, absolutely. Good. And we'll talk about that next time around. Yeah, absolutely. James, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Folks, thank you very much. Uh, it's been very entertaining to to um, to chat with Mr. Winters, or Professor Winters. And uh, as always, he's, he's very enlightened, he's well-rounded. And I, I hope it's an inspiration for you young folks out there. Get your education, as you say. Get your education, work hard, and you will achieve. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, the Oregon Voter Digest. Have a good one.